Yeah, it's really important for us to look at our bodies as one whole. And although, like I said, we test everything individually, we have to talk about how they all work together. You know, just because we have a problem with one area doesn't mean it's affecting something else. And as it pertains to uh, cancer treatments and the diagnosis of cancer, you know, one of the major aspects of that is ototoxicity. And that's... Um, and like, like Jerry was saying, the pediatric patients, I mean, it is a set protocol that we have to monitor every six months prior to and as they're undergoing and post um, to ensure that any of the medications that, were, that are being taken aren't affecting certain parts of our body in ways we don't want it to, because if there's an option where we can alter something, we want to do that. Um, with ototoxicity monitoring and with hearing loss, the result of that is typically permanent. It's irreversible. So it's, crit it's one of those things that once we lose our hearing, it is gone. So it's such a critical topic. And so that's why I'm very excited to get to talk to you guys about that. So we can continue to advocate and educate. Um, so right now, this is just a little bit about me. Um, I am, I'm an audiologist. I work at Atlantic Hearing Balance and Tinnitus Center in Port Orange, Florida. Um, we currently have clinics located you know, all across the East Coast, but I, I go to the Ormond Beach Clinic in Port Orange mainly, but we also have clinics in Titusville, New Smyrna, Palm Coast. Uh, currently hoping we're gonna be able to serve the community in the St. Augustine area. Um, moving forward, um, I'm certified with the American Speech Language Hearing Association. So this is um, a group that uh, basically continues to ensure quality hearing care is being done for adults and pediatrics across the nation. Um, I did my fourth year residency program at the uh, Biloxi VA Medical Center in Biloxi, Mississippi. And I hold a doctorate degree from the University of Southern Mississippi in audiology. So when we're talking about ototoxicity, you know, what we're talking about is ear poisoning that comes from the exposure to certain drugs. And these drugs, um, they do help. The key, they've been shown to help the, you know, with cancer and other related uh, illnesses but they are, can be very damaging to the inner ear system. And inside our inner ear, we've got that vestibular cochlear nerve, which controls our hearing and our balance. Um, so I first and foremost wanna kind of explain how we hear. Um, really why it's so critical is the ears are the funnel for the brain. So, you know, when we are hearing, sound is traveling through our ear, it hits our eardrum, it moves the little bones, and then it travels to our organ of hearing, which is known as the cochlea. You know, the cochlea is directly attached to our balance organ. So if there's a problem going on in there, it can affect the balance. Uh, once sound passes through there, it travels up the auditory nerve and processes on either side of the brain. Biggest thing is if there is a problem along this pathway and the brain is not getting the information it needs, the brain will overwork to get that information. Okay, that overworking of the brain can put us at risk down the road for memory loss and cognitive decline. And that's because there's a part of the brain that's responsible for processing and encoding information. So if the brain is not getting the information, the brain will have to rewire and permanently forget how to do it. Um, and that's what we're trying to prevent from happening with ototoxicity monitoring. So a kind of a little intro is there's various therapeutic medications that can cause damage and a lot of those drugs are used in cancer treatments. I mean, you can even look up Tylenol and there's gonna be ototoxic properties there too. Um, and after a significant amount of time of taking these medication, the damage is permanent, we can't reverse it. And so that's why we wanna ensure whatever medication you're taking, we're monitoring you as you take it and post. 
um, not only for the benefit of you, but for the benefit of uh, people going through the treatments later on, because the more information we find out about each given treatment, the better off we will be in the future. So some commonly used drugs in oncology treatment would be the cisplatin. Um, carboplatin is another one that's a close relative. And these drugs have listed that they are cochleotoxic. So, and I don't, you know, depending on what drugs, if you know the drug that you were taking while undergoing these treatments, you know, that's important because each drug is going to have different properties. And like I said before, although we're treating one thing, you know, the body works together. So we have to know how it's going to affect the whole body system. Um, the biggest side effect with something's ototoxic is going to be hearing loss. And usually when taken, the damage is bilateral, meaning both ears and irreversible. Okay. How the progression starts is hearing loss is started more so in the higher frequencies. Um, high frequency hearing loss can be difficult for a lot of patients to notice. Um, than lower frequencies, because if you can think about it, the lower pitches of sound um, give us like the boominess. We hear that train going by, right? But those higher frequencies give us the clarity and the understanding, which is what we use to help discriminate, especially in a noisy environment. So the high frequency hearing loss are usually gradual and people don't notice until it starts affecting their low. So by the time we get that, it could be too late. And during this whole process, you know, as we're losing these higher frequencies, we're losing a part of the brain that helps with understanding. We're losing that processing and encoding capabilities. And the problem with that is you don't get that part back. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen anybody um, who's, you know, either treating their hearing loss the right way. Um, and, you know, you're, you're like, they still don't understand what I'm saying. And, I, you know, and you're like, aren't you, aren't you wearing a hearing aid? You know, can't you, why can't you understand me? Is it not loud enough? What's going on? And the thing about that is we can restore the hearing back to normal levels, but we can't restore the understanding. Once it's gone, it's gone. And that's those processes that help with the encoding um, to understand. So we don't want to have a gradual decrease in hearing. We want to find, find out where it's, we want to treat it early so that we can continue to prevent the brain from further deteriorating in that understanding process. We wanna hold that. And that's what makes, you know, ototoxicity monitoring, hearing loss, um, you know, baseline testing, treating hearing loss, a, a more preventative model than people realize. Um, so, you know, in regards to how, how long, how fast does this happen? is they have done research that states that the ototoxicity properties can occur anywhere from hours to days after treatment, you know, and that's something that, you know, should shock everybody because if, if we're not, if we're no, not noticing the gradual decline or it's, we're no, it's happening in the highs before the lows and we're not monitoring it, I mean, hours to days, how are you supposed to prevent that, right? So, how does, how does it start to do that? Well, inside the cochlea, we've got these hair cells that pick up the pitch of the sound and send it to the brain. So what that medication is gonna start off doing is selectively damage those hair cells in that organ. And over time, it'll induce death of those hair cells. And you, like I said, you don't get those back either. Um, and so that, that can be something that can be easily monitored to prevent it from even moving further. So the importance of ototoxicity monitoring. So here's the thing, in the grand scheme of things, we understand if you um, are, you know, have, have this battle and you're, you're undergoing treatment for chemotherapy or cancer related therapies, of course, we don't want you to stop the treatment. You know, we want you to get better. It's no question. In the grand scheme of things, you wanna, you wanna move forward and be healthy. Um, but why is it important to do this is we want to detect ototoxic damage um, before it causes a loss of, of hearing in the speech frequencies, 
If we can do that, if we can monitor and detect, we can go to your oncologist and say, hey, we're working with you. Is there another drug that they can try that will do the same thing, but not induce hair cell death or cochlea, death of the cochlea? So what, that's what we wanna do. And it is possible we can alter treatment, it's done. Pediatric, they do it all, all the time, like Jerry was saying, they do it all the time. So, and then what it all can also do is it can begin early intervention and treatment of hearing loss. Like going back to that word understanding, if we can treat hearing loss early, although the hearing can get worse, if we can hold that understanding portion or that percent of understanding, we're gonna be doing much better. And so for example, I get patients all the time that go so long without treating their hearing loss. And we do a test, a speech test where we say, okay, what can your brain do? What can it understand? And, you know, some patients we can only get 50% of understanding. So we're having the conversation of, we need to treat your hearing loss, but your prognosis is 50% understanding. Are you ready to do this? rather than having patients that say, okay, your prognosis is 96% understanding. We need to do this, but we're gonna be that successful with our understanding. And that's, that's amazing. So the early intervention is a key component in that. So I, I like this slide for certain reasons because you know it discusses what is recommended for monitoring ototoxicity and um, the biggest thing you can gauge from this is early intervention. Um, if, we, if we can intervene when something, the perception of decreased hearing ability occurs, we're gonna be doing so much better. And we ultimately, we don't want ototoxicity to occur because we don't want hearing loss to happen. We know it's permanent. We don't want that to be a thing. So, how important is pretreatment audiometric baseline testing? It is so important. It is critical. If you're not doing it, I mean, if you're not doing anything else, you should be getting a baseline. And I mean, I'm sure you get a you get a baseline in everything before you undergo any type of therapy or treatment. So, let's talk about the ears. Let's talk about the balance. Um, so, if we are going to make a recommendation to alter the treatment we have to have a baseline test. If we do not have a baseline test, we will not have enough skin in the game essentially to even make a recommendation. Because if, if we can't prove where you came from, we, we can't say, well, th they could say this could have come from this, or this could be noise induced, or this could be, you know, come, come from this medical issue that ha happened or this could be from childhood. You know, we, we have to have the baseline before so we can have enough information to say, yeah, if there's another drug that's gonna do the same thing, let's switch and see what happens, you know? And so that's, that's, that's why it's so critical because physicians have to obtain clear associations um, between if it's a new onset or if it's just worsening or if, it, if it's been there for a while. Um, and so that's, that's why it's so critical just to go ahead and get your baseline test. And moving forward, like what, what should your baseline test include? Um, my, my opinion what, and what is recommended is any test that has the potential to be requested or needed throughout the treatment process should be included, okay? When we talk about the baseline test, you wanna make sure you're going to somewhere that's reputable, that somewhere that does best practices. You're gonna to wanna to have a standard evaluation that includes typical audiometric testing with ultra high frequency testing. Cause like we talked about before, those ultra high frequencies are gonna be the first to go. So you wanna to wanna to go to a place that's able to do that. A speech testing otoacoustic emissions, um, which are detections of responses in those hair cells. So we wanna make sure you can get that. Reflex and reflex decay testing. That is those little bones in our ears. We're testing to make sure they're giving us a good response and they're working. Um, tympanometry is a test to rule out any fluid buildup in the ears. 
if there's any holes in the ears, we want to make sure the volume of the ear canal is healthy, the eardrum's healthy. Um, Another test is an auditory brainstem response test, which is, is a good tool to confirm that the audiometric data is correct. Um, I, I even have seen where vestibular testing, which is testing the health of the balance organ, um, is critical to make sure that nothing's affecting that. I've seen it too many times where different medications, a patient's come in from with a medication change and we do the vestibular or the balance exam because they're having balance loss and we find a problem, but it's, I can't say for certain if it's because of that drug or if that's been there for a while. It's just, we, we can't do that unless we know prior to what we're looking at. Um, so baseline testing, as you can see, should be very comprehensive. And when I say it should be done at a reputable, reputable facility, and that does best practices because unfortunately, hearing healthcare is not regulated very well nationwide. Um, Florida is a real big mess. Um, it's just, you know, very high retiree population, but you only need a high school diploma and you can open up a hearing aid store. I mean, it is, and, and sure, if that's, the, if that's the goal, then, you know, that's where you go. But one of the biggest things is if you're looking for a comprehensive evaluation, you're not going to walk want to walk into any of these hearing aid stores. I mean, you don't need to be so, sold a hearing aid. You need comprehensive testing that's going to tell you all of this information, someone that, someplace that does best practice, and that's going to be critical. Um, so that, that's really important, too. And, there, you know, you'll find there's only select places that do, do best practices. It's because the equipment's very expensive to have. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, Jerry, you, were you the one that told me that the only place you, you could, University of Florida, do they have the vestibular equipment that we have? Um, I, I'm not sure, but I mean, you were the only one I could find anywhere. Um, because when I asked up there, they were going to send me to a, an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And I knew that wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. um, because I knew I needed um, more than that. So honestly, in the central Florida area, I, I think um, where you are is the only place I know that has audiologists that also specialize in balance, um, you know, to help prevent all the, the other things. Because I've been looking. I mean, not everybody wants, you know, to drive because um, this support group goes all over Florida. So I don't think somebody from Miami wants to drive up right. here um you know so it's it, it it's really hard to find an audiologist who specializes in balance as well um, and, that, and, and that's that's something that's going to be important and yes of course if you want if you didn't want to do that testing i mean you just have to suffer, the consequence of that is should you lose balance or should you lose hearing that turns into balance loss um we're going to want that we we're going to wish we had that baseline so Biggest stem is we need a baseline, um, ultimately, just so we can know what's going on prior to. Um, There's a question in the uh, chat about someone who's already been in treatment for several months. Uh -huh. Is she basically screwed or can she get a baseline where she's at now? Yes. Yeah, so what I was about to touch on right now is, you know, if we don't have a baseline, it is going to be critical that we monitor if you're undergoing treatment now, or let's say you're six months, every six months, I would say it's gonna be so important to come in, even if it's a, a, the full baseline test and then we're doing screenings every six months and then a full baseline every year. The recommendation is every year we should get a baseline, a full evaluation baseline, right? Um, but for those undergoing different treatments, we will want to see you every six months to monitor and ensure that everything's staying stable. Um, and so if, she, if she, she's, I, I'm sorry, I can't even see the chat, but if you're undergoing treatment, you know, sure, would, do we wish we had a baseline? Absolutely, but let's get you in and get you scheduled to see what's going on at this moment in time and then six months prior to that so we can kind of monitor your case. Um, but absolutely, it's just, it should so important just so we can continue to monitor because this is something you don't get back. And that's, that's one of the most unfortunate things, but absolutely come in, get, get a full evaluation just so you have it on record. 
and then should things continue we'll be able to see what's going on because essentially like the like back to the slide of we monitor this so that we can provide the early intervention um we want to be familiar with any anything that's going to help a patient whether hearing loss does come on and we're ready for it we're ready to treat right then and there um and we want to be able to work with oncologists to help um and more help is better for you guys. We wanna to continue to educate and advocate. That's, those are two big things. Um, and essentially the baseline evaluation is critical for what we're trying to do. There's um, another question. Um, she wanted to know who's, would her doctors um, know the risk? And I'm sorry to say, no, the oncologists don't. Unfortunately, maybe at some of your centers they might, but bottom line is they really don't know. Um, and she wanted to know if you should see an ear, nose and throat doctor. Um, from my personal experience, they don't usually have the equipment that the audiologists have, but Dr. Pollock, you can. Yeah, no, we work, we work hand in hand with ear, nose and throat. Um, the biggest differences between what ear, nose, and throat does and what we do is, you know, we, we specialize in the hearing, you know, we specialize in the balance and the hearing. Ear, nose, and throat um, does all kinds of different things where they do allergies, surgeries, um, you know, PE tubes and things like that. But when it comes to the hearing and the, and the balance, uh, we do the diagnostic testing. They may have, some ENTs may be really good and may have that equipment available, but you know, pediatric level all the way up to a, the adult population. I mean, audiology has been known as they specialize in hearing, tinnitus and balance and how to treat it, um, which is a big, a big thing. So uh, I, love, I love all of our ENTs, they're wonderful. Um, but it's just, you know, like I said, if it's just all about if we have everything, a baseline where we can get you in and see what's going on, we can know how to monitor it down the road. Um, there's another question. Um, do the effects of chemo end after treatment stops or it continue for some time? So post is going to be very important too, because I've seen it where, you know, patients have in the past, you know, recovered, um, but there's still, if there's still that damage in that outer hair cell function, and when you mix that with age-related hearing loss, we just have a spiral type type of effect. So I would continue, it's recommended for, ever, for people that are not undergoing any type of treatment, it is recommended to have an annual test every, so if, if it's recommended for everybody to have an annual test, then for someone, you know, undergoing different therapeutic um, methods, we, we need to just continue to monitor every six months. 